Welcome back to Revolution in Ideology. I'm Jared. I'm Nick. And today we are talking about Nestor Machno and the Black Army, better known as the Revolutionary Insurrection- Insurrectionary Army of Ukraine. Um, we are kind of in a Russia part of our series at this point between Nick's um, sociological look at Russian nihilism and some of the literature behind Russian nihilism. And of course, we recently just um, did an episode on the Russian Revolution itself, although we were a little bit tentative in doing so, given, of course, the gravity of everybody that is still, for some reason, stakeholders in this revolution. But regardless, as we were doing um, these episodes, we came to the conclusion that uh, there's just not a lot of information out there on this black army and Nestor Machno, and given that our channel deals heavily with like anarchist cues how did this how did this fall through the cracks so to speak right anything you want to add no like it's funny because we're not even trying to go in any kind of chronological order like on our channel it's just random that we're like deep in 19th and 20th century Russia right now for some reason yeah I mean this might be kind of like the tail end of it at, at this point because our, our Russian knowledge does get a little bit limited the history I teach is not usually Russian history um yeah and the next thing yeah, yeah the next thing if we're going to continue the nihilism series is like Max Turner and then Nietzsche and like we're so moving we're to Germany with, yeah. yeah okay cool anyway let's get this show on the road Nestor Machno and the Black Army so um, again it is important that we discuss ideology here in this specific case because the Black Army um, engaged in not just parts of the tail end of the revolutionary process but importantly the Russian Civil War which is really kind of the era we're going to be focusing on which by the way I guess we should mention if you haven't watched our episode on the Russian Revolution you can do that and that'll give a little context here right Jared mentions uh, Nestor Machno in that episode which is what sparked this episode so you don't have to but it'll give you the background on the russian revolution at least absolutely and we also need to discuss like the ideology of uh machno and the black army or at least much of the black army because it's very different than what the bolsheviks um posited um and their discourse but it was also quite different than of course um the prior czarist regime and was also very different than other actors that were wildly nationalist especially in ukraine he was not a ukrainian nationalist um at least not ideologically speaking it's not that he did not oftentimes work with ukrainian nationalists if they had a common cause sometimes like fighting either the czar's army or the red army but he himself was not a, a ukrainian nationalist so let's talk about the ideologies that often fall under the umbrella of Macnowism, or um, or just really, I, I, I guess the ideas that the Black Army was trying to instill in Ukraine um, during its movement during the Civil War. Okay. So the first one we want to talk about, and all these are related, by the way, and there's a lot of overlap. So it's kind of interesting that ideologues try and like differentiate the three. I'm going to try and differentiate the three while also tongue in cheek insinuating that they're all super similar. So let's talk about them real fast. The first is anarcho-communism. Um, Nick has dove into this in prior episodes in much more depth than I'm willing to do here. But in short, anarcho-communists um, support abolition of the state. That is like first and foremost, abolish the state. This is the first thing that's going to like actually um, lead them to kind of like come to a head with the Bolsheviks. They are not trying to uh, abolish the state by any stretch of the imagination. They're trying to create a new state. Um, Okay, so abolition of the state, um, abolition of capitalism, that's pretty obvious, abolition of wage labor, abolition of social hierarchy, and abolition of private property. Um, And it must be made clear that uh, for listeners that aren't necessarily used to talking about anarchism or communism or socialism, private property is not personal property. Personal property would be respected by the anarchists in this case. So things like your shirt or your your, your toothbrush or whatever, those things are things you don't have to share. Private property... I like how it's completely random that we just pick toothbrushes and like ran with it. That's the example I use every time. time Yeah, I don't know why, but that's the one I use every time. But real quick, all right, so... Mr. Sociologist, again, real quick, personal property versus private property. What's the difference? I like to explain it as personal property, like you just said, it's your shirt, it's your toothbrush, it's your whatever. You're like personal belongings. Private property is something that could be a capital asset that you could use to like exploit someone else, right? So I can't exploit someone with my toothbrush, but I could, if I owned a million toothbrushes, sell that on the market and exploit people if I, whatever, or a factory, right? That's clearly the example of this time specifically and when Marx was writing and so forth, owning a factory like that's private property, according to those definitions. Thus, the anarcho-communists in question here did support common ownership of the means of production. That's a big part of anarcho-communism. So like that would be for for this group in the Ukraine, it would be less factories and more like the land, right? The land that is yielding a lot of the grains. And like in Um, really, really simple terms, I explain it like because people are like, what's the difference between communism and anarcho-communism? Well, 
the socialists, which is who we're talking about here at being like sort of the contrast, want to establish the proletariat controlled state in order to bring about communism. The anarchists want to completely abolish the state in order to bring about communism. Well, and here's the key, right? So one of the things that also led to like the head to head between the Bolsheviks and the Black Army at some point, at least ideologically speaking, was that the Black Army and the anarcho-communists supported a direct democracy, which the Bolsheviks did not support. They Mm -hmm. support ideas of direct democracy and free association within that democracy. So at this point, like that's very different. There's not direct democracy in Bolshevism. Um, They might argue that there is, but there wasn't. And Yeah. yeah, ever. So, okay. They also believed in horizontal, and this is the key word, voluntary organization of workers' councils, or better known as, quote-unquote, Soviets. So, again, Soviet is not, like, a word that is unique to just, like, the communists. Like, Soviet is literally just a workers' council or a union or whatever. We, we actually um, have gotten a couple of corrections on what um, a Soviet actually is, but it yeah. is an organization of workers. Well, I mean, it's one of those words that can mean, like, 20 different things, right? So, which is... Great, but we, the, the nuances but are unnecessary the here. The organization was meant to be horizontal, which again, at least in terms of Bolshevik practice, maybe not what the Bolsheviks were arguing, but in terms of Bolshevik practice was not something they were doing with the Soviets. Okay, so that's important. And it was voluntary. It was about free association. So just because you were a peasant uh, on the land or a worker in the factory didn't mean you were automatically going to be forced into working with the Soviet. It was a complete voluntary association. Okay, and of course, importantly, anarcho-communism at that time was most popularly inspired by Peter Kropotkin. And even though we don't have an episode on him, maybe we should at some point, but I'll let you mm-hmm. take up that, take up the mantle of, of teaching us a little bit about Peter Perka- uh, Kropotkin. Okay. We do have an episode on Bakunin, though, which yes. is sort of like the, around the well, same time. we're about time. to get to him here okay, a little cool. bit. Okay, so libertarian socialism is the other moniker often used to discuss the ideals of the Black Army and Nestor Mach. Now, it's pretty much the same as anarcho-communism in a whole host of ways with the specific critique of state-sponsored socialism. Um, anarcho-communism has, has like the same beef as like libertarian socialism regarding like fighting against state-sponsored socialism, but during the time period, it just wasn't as important to the discourse. So in other words, anarcho-communism as more of like kind of a pure, like egalitarian and perhaps even pie in the sky belief existed, the libertarian socialists take all of that and then also argue part of the process is fighting state-sponsored socialism specifically. So it's just like that edit added like layer that like mm-hmm. like the state-sponsored socialism is almost, if not as bad as the state-sponsored monarchy. Any right. thoughts no, on that? No, that's a good way of putting it. Okay. So it's just that added extra layer of like kind of like a little bit more revolutionary discourse, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, And finally, collectivism, which is essentially decentralized productive system. Individuals are paid off of their surplus labor, whereas like the other two have no wages. The reason this is important is sometimes the Black Army is also like the label of collectivism is a little different than the other two in that both of those seek to abolish wages altogether, whereas collectivism is more of like a watered down version where there is still wage wage labor, but you're paid off of your surplus labor in a more equitable way than like we would be now in a modern capitalist society at the the fast food restaurant Mm -hmm. or the retail store or something along those lines. So collectivism would be like the more watered down version of the other two. I only mention it here because sometimes when you do the research on this, um, some of the ideals of the black army are labeled as collectivist, whereas some are labeled as anarcho-communist or libertarian socialist. The collectivism um, in my research was more Bakunin inspired, which I in our readings of Bakunin, and we've done a lot of research on Bakunin, and less so Kropotkin, I guess I just didn't see the connectivity with Bakunin, and maybe I just have not read enough of it, and I've read a lot of it, where he specifically discusses not the abolition of wage labor, but merely the more equitable distribution thereof. Have you uncovered anything? No, but that specific idea gets convoluted so much because very few of the theorists specifically talk about that very point. Right. So like Marxists often talk about how that can be like, let's call them wage credits or labor credits or something. Right. Can be a transition phase between like the exploitation of capitalism and the complete abolition of like wages and things like that. But there's not a lot of uh, the most prominent theorists that specifically say that. Right. So it's like kind of some extrapolation going on. Right. 
Okay, well, let's talk about the man, the myth, the legend, uh, Nestor Machno. He lived between 1888 and 1934, so um, eh, relatively long life, I guess, for the turn of the 20th century. Let's talk about his ideal first. Now, he didn't, like, like write this as, like, a child or anything. This is obviously later in life that he wrote this, but I think it's a good way to kind of, like, frame who he is and what he was about before we dig a little bit into his life. So, okay, his ideal, and I quote, this comes from his publication, Anarchist Revolution. He says, Anarchism does not depend on theory or programs, which try to grasp man's life in its entirety. It is a teaching, which is based on real life, which outgrows all artificial limitations, which can't be constrained by any system. Anarchism's outward form is a free, non-governed society which offers freedom, equality, and solidarity for its members. Its foundations are to be found in man's sense of mutual responsibility, which has remained unchanged in all places and times. The sense of responsibility is capable of securing freedom and social justice for all men by its own unaided efforts. It's also the foundation of true communism. Anarchism, therefore, is a part of human nature. Communism, its logical extension. I mean, that. that's a good summary of... I mean, everything His we ideals just talked for about. sure, yeah. Yeah, everything we just mm-hmm. talked about. Like, 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 the argument is that, like, a socialist or communist ideal is, like, just natural. That's how mm-hmm. we want to be. We want to be able to engage with each other on a more equitable level, right? Like, we want that. It's human nature. We could maybe do another episode on human nature. Those ones were never so popular, but I like them. Well, but- so when we do the episode on Kropotkin, which I will take on, his whole book is was it on mutual aid, right? Yeah is a factor in human evolution i think that's the full title is a is a contrast to darwin's uh the origin of the species right Right. and he's arguing that mutual aid is part of human nature so we'll touch on that when we get to that episode and not just human nature i would argue the whole natural world but that's Mm -hmm. that's something completely different but yeah i think we we need to do a little an episode on that because again we would argue that human nature is more about like again reciprocity and gift giving Mm -hmm. and back and forth and understanding that we are part of a system rather than rugged individuals doing it all on our own like that's where we want to be and we have been socialized into believing that whereas that's not necessarily our reality and yeah we did it's completely unsustainable psychologically i think it was our very first two episodes on the podcast yeah, that we they did were human so yeah, yeah if you haven't watched those or listened to them you can go back and find yeah. those the first two we did like an intro episode and then the first two real episodes were two episodes on human nature and in that case we were using uh like ancient anthropological evidence to make those arguments but mm-hmm. again those ones never ended up being too popular anyway moving on let's get back to the black army okay I, guess, I don't know do they qualify as ancient we were talking about like hobbes and rousseau and stuff there we were talking about their views though using like yeah. that stuff, like like their interpretation of those anthropological right. and historical findings. So yeah. anyway, all right, yeah, because Graeber was in there as well. Yeah, yeah he's not ancient. Oh, I see what you're I saying. Like, like archaeological yes, stuff. Gotcha. They're looking at yeah. that stuff, and yeah. we're using their academic studies. Yeah. I was like, Hobbes didn't there. know shit about yeah. ancient anything. Yeah. yeah. So okay, moving on. All right, so. Regarding Nestor Machno, there are like dueling narratives. He's one of the most controversial figures of this period, perhaps even more so than like the Lenins or the Trotskys in this regard, because he is hated by the right and the left. And like the left is pretty like adamant about their like dislike of what he was about, especially during the time period. But even in retrospect, one of the other things I'll probably touch upon in like the concluding thoughts here is that is the they're both right and left have made a um, damning accusation of him to like lower his character character although research that i've unearthed has revealed none of this but anti-semitism is also something used to kind of denigrate machno's character he himself again based on even people like more recent studies that have been critical of machno especially from like the marxist left also have not unearthed any actual anti-semitism but i do feel like it needs to at least be mentioned in case any of you go like google this guy or whatever like yes it, 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 it's which is like ironic coming from the right or the left because many of the prominent theorists on both sides were anti-semites at the time well and again there's evidence that he even shouted down the anti-semites because he there were anti-semites in the ukrainian nationalist movement absolutely it was a big part of the ukrainian nationalist movement but that's not what he was about again in theory he even wrote uh one of his 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 writings and i forget the actual title and maybe nick can pull it up or something along those lines was like basically to the jews of the world more or less like saying like look like everything you've heard about me is not correct although i want to correct myself i just said the left and the right what i meant was the anarchists and the marxists right all right. Anyway, okay. So, dueling narratives. Who is this guy? So, Daniel Cohn uh, Bendit um, from Obsolete Communism, the left wing alternative, had this to say 
about uh, Nestor Machna. He says the Machna Vichina, which I mispronounced, again, my Russian is terrible, better perhaps than any other movement shows that the Russian Revolution could have become a great liberating force. I like that quote because it's like the optimism there that Nestor Machna and the Black Army represented, but also it is damning to the Red Army and the Bolsheviks and what actually happened because during the revolution. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. you touched on in the last episode a little bit. Yeah, like they could have done so much more. Mm-hmm. Okay. The other side, here's the other side, and this comes from an author named Armstrong um, in his um, really in-depth, and it was a good source, even though he doesn't like Mach now, it seems. It was a good source and a lot of information. Armstrong, in the Marxist Left Review, he wrote this in 2016. He says, Machno is worth studying, not just because he's a controversial historical figure, but because his movement reveals the profound dichotomy in anarchist politics, the enormous separation between their utopian theory and their practice. As many anarchists are little more than romantic dreamers, this contradiction is not sharply put. So Armstrong is clearly a Marxist and anarchist. I don't want to say like hater, but like the common argument that they're just too pie in the sky, too right. dreamy, too like too much faith in human nature and like really supportive of that idea of like the revolutionary vanguard and we need this intelligentsia to teach the unwashed masses. Yeah, and if you know like the dynamics of other. Yeah. Marxist critique, right? Being utopic is a critique often handed out by Marxists. So it's, it's actually interesting because every time I think about that now, I think about the episode we did on Marcuse's End of Utopia. Right. Check that out if you haven't watched that one as well. So it's into this weird foray on the left where part of the left sees like Machno and the Black Army as an inspiration for what could have been and the other part damns him for being too much of a dreamer, too much of an idealist. Um, and thus not his vision was not practical is what they might say um, or utilitarian. Regardless, let's keep moving. This is like this is the the milieu that we jump into with Nestor Machno on the left. OK, so in his his younger years, I'll do them super briefly. He's born in Gulia Pole, Pole. I, I don't know. I yeah, I, my Russian is terrible. I apologize. Um, anyway, in Ukraine. His father died before he was one year old. Um, he also worked as a child shepherd as, as, as young as like six or seven years old. So he was put to work like very early on. As a teenager, he worked as a painter and eventually um, in an iron foundry where he started getting political. So it's when he starts going into this iron foundry, a little bit more of the industrial world, that he gets a little bit more political. Weird. Again, term of the industrial revolution, labor movements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, absolutely. By 1906, he had joined anarchist organizations to combat what he called, or in what many call, historians call, state-sponsored terrorism by both the local Ukrainian officials, or maybe like the, 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 those loyal to the monarchists, and the monarchy itself. Again, the revolution hasn't taken place. He ends up getting arrested um, three to four times for like little charges like robbery until in 1910, he's actually sentenced to life in, um, in prison for murder. Um, to be blunt, he didn't like go out and like target one individual and just like murder them. But there was a shootout during one of the movements and protests and strikes, like all three of those things at the same time. And um, some cops died. Some cops died and he ends up getting charged for murder. He served at the... Butirskaya prison in Moscow. You want to try that one out? No, absolutely not. <laughs> okay. Where he meets uh, uh, Peter Arshinov. And for those of you that know a little bit about Makhna, which I'm sure we drew, drew, drew in some of you that already know like way, you know, way too much about Makhna, um, you'll know a little bit about Peter Arshinov. It ends up being his cellmate while he's in jail. Um, Peter is a seasoned anarchist, even a former Bolshevik with a record of organizing, publishing, and um, extreme militancy. Um, his organization of rail factory workers, for example, led to like the assassination of like their boss and the bombing of a police station, which is why he ends up in jail. He actually escaped jail multiple times until get, getting nailed again later on in life for um, distributing propaganda. And this is where he ends up meeting Nestor Machnow. So they end up as sailmates. So this a little bit more seasoned revolutionary meets Machnow and further kind of like teaches him about the ways of being a revolutionary do you ever think back to like these times and think about how much easier it must have been to break out of jail <laughs> like yeah everyone we've talked to, trotsky was breaking out of jail lenin's like on the run in europe yeah like yeah it, it must have fidel castro no fidel castro got pardoned sorry no nope. yeah can't use that example but anyway um Arshinov ends up being also Machnow's main biographer. So if you end up doing your own research on Machnow, you're going to run across um, Peter Arshinov. He's based, it's like his biographer. And he talks about like the Machnow movement and what they were about. 
He ends up being released from prison, Mock now does, in 1917, and he immediately forms a peasants' union and forcefully began expropriating large, at, large estates from landowners and redistributing land to peasants. He does this without the okay of Lenin or Trotsky or any of these other guys that get credit for all of these amazing things that happened during the Russian Revolution. He just does it. And we talked about this last episode, mm -hmm. that when these more famous, quote-unquote, Bolsheviks end up showing up, they take credit for shit that's already happening. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think it's just, he's just like one dude, which I'm sure with other people, I mean, I'm sure. But like, yeah, they're just out doing it. You know, yeah. they aren't waiting for permission. They're not they don't care what the leadership is doing. They're just going to go make this happen, which right. I guess is like more of an anarchist thing to do. Right. Right. Lenin does this in his various decrees once the revolution is over. And like I said, he says he mentioned makes little mention of it in his very famous April theses that we read in the last episode on the Russian Revolution. But I must stress, like the the, the boots on the ground, literally the Nestor Machnos of the world were already doing this before the Bolsheviks take power. OK. There's also this very famous treaty that's been brought up a handful of times called the brest litovsk litovsk Treaty, God, I can never pronounce this, between the Soviets and Germany, which ended up ceding most of Ukraine to the Central Powers. So we brought this treaty up in terms of like ending World War I for the, um, for the Soviet Union, but in terms of what it meant to Ukraine, which is where Nestor, he's Ukrainian, what matters to him is it actually cedes much of Ukraine to the Central Powers, i.e. the Germans and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which of course he was not super thrilled with, as were not uh, many Ukrainian nationalists. Again, he wasn't necessarily one of those. They're not thrilled with this either. This is just going to like fuel this revolutionary fervor in Ukraine. Though I guess they wouldn't have been happy either way if it got ceded right. to Russia either. No. Um, because of this, a coup actually takes place at the top of Ukrainian politics. Um, it's led by a man named Pavlo uh, Skoropadsky uh, against the Ukrainian Republic. Ukrainian nationalists inspired saw the Austro-Hungarian and German influence as like a major issue. Like, again, it's it's we're not German, we're not Austro-Hungarian, we're Ukrainian. We're not even Russian, we're Ukrainian, and this is going to be a new independent Ukraine. And again, like, this is tied to, like, the growing nationalist movement throughout, like, the West during the World War I era. It is a undoubtedly a nationalist war. It's also a capitalist and an industrialist war, but it's undoubtedly a nationalist war. And a lot of that, I mean, shoot, the war starts because of a uh, people that saw themselves oppressed seeking their own nation state in the case of Serbia, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so this argument that sometimes we're hearing that like, ah, oh, nationalism just didn't, like, it is a nationalist war. The war is kicked off by people seeking their own national yeah, sovereignty. Yeah, I, I just can't relate to anyone that claims that right. World War One somehow wasn't related to nationalism. Yeah, it makes no I, sense. And even, like I said, the other like offshoots like it creates this like structuralist context in which even if like winners and losers of certain parts of the war or again connected issues like the russian revolution even if it's not if, if that's not per se a nationalist war nationalism still has an impact on mm -hmm. it it's still influential and i think that's like that's something that's very important a lot of people like kind of lose sight of that all right uh, in terms of uh, what's going on in the Ukraine, there are further material and ideal splits taking place, i.e. nationalism versus anarchism for Ukraine's eventual fate. There are also peasant bands that are either Bolshevik or anarchist, and oftentimes they flip-flop depending on who's quote-unquote meeting their immediate material needs. And again, ideologically speaking, the split is not as big as maybe even I make it out to be. They just have different paths to get to this ideal society, Bolsheviks versus anarchists. They're both seeking kind of the end, the same end result. But the path there is what's different. But if you are, again, merely like a peasant worker or working as an in an iron foundry, for example, whichever one seems most likely at a given moment to get you to where you want to go is probably the one you're going to side with. And that's why a lot of them ended up flip-flocking between like siding with Bolsheviks or anarchists. Um, and sometimes perhaps even nationalists. So like there was a lot of like, there's not like double agency, J double agents. We're not talking like Benedict Arnold style stuff here, but like people that were willing to like, again, like work with whoever could meet their immediate goals. And that's not unique to this situation here. We've seen this in other uh, revolutions we've covered, the Iranian revolution, uh, the Cuban revolution, the American war for independence, like the, the, this whole ideal that everybody was like some super gung-ho patriot for the United States. That's not the case. Some of them were just imme immediately working with um, the leadership at the time because they wanted autonomy, right? Like that's- Yeah, it's never black and white, right? Yeah. There's this great- a fluctuation throughout any movement or war that this is going on, right? So soon after the coup in the Ukraine, um, eventually uh, Machnow himself seizes military command. Again, he just he just went and did things. He just did shit. Um, in oh gosh, I am not going to be able to pronounce um, this this Russian word. Maybe we should just have like I don't know. Um, 
what's her name the uh, the 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 siri maybe we should have siri just pronounce these <laughs> words for us yekatiranas yekatiranoslav sorry everybody i know it's like nails on a chalkboard if you're a native like russian speaker i apologize but anyway i'm just laughing that you just referred to siri as if she was a real person so i mean ai like consciousness should we do an episode <laughs> oh god <laughs> six hours buckle up right uh all right anyway he, he he sees his military command in this province of anarchist groups and due to his growing legend followers soon uh began identifying themselves as well as outsiders began identifying them out now as machnavists um later they would be formally named the revolutionary insurrectionary army of ukraine their first targets, this milit now he's like basically a military leader. Their first targets are, of course, the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians that they see as foreign occupiers or influencers. Their next targets would be, of course, the White Army, which we talked about during the um, uh, the last episode where we briefly go through the Civil War. Um, their later targets would be Ukrainian nationalists. Again, Maknow is not a Ukrainian nationalist. He is an anarchist. And anarchists do not believe in nationalism. So he, he definitely targeted them. I mean, really, like we said last time, neither should socialists. But... And coming back to one of the charges against him, there are o there's also evidence that he targeted anti-Semitic nationalist paramilitary. So him being an anti-Semite is unlikely if his forces were targeting anti-Semitic paramilitaries. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, moving on. The tactics they used were what made him a target then and a target now of like deprecation of his character, basically. Um, he it was no holds barred. They did whatever it took to defeat these these groups and some even like throw the word around terrorism. Although, again, I don't know if it's any more terrorist than what the Bolsheviks were doing, than what the Tsar's army was doing, than what literally every army during World War One was doing. I don't. I don't believe that. I think the word is used specifically here um, to denigrate like the black army and the anarchist cause. Yeah, it's like it's never correlates truthfully to the actions. It's a political yeah. tool, right? To be unequivocally clear, yes, gulags are terrorism to me. So yes, the Bolsheviks were responsible for terrorism. Um, sarin gas is terrorism. So yes, the Brits and the Germans and the French and whoever gassed people during World War One, they're also terrorists. So again, right. like the word, it, it's because they're using fear and violence for a political goal in this yeah. case yeah it's just yeah it's out of control the way we like throw this word around anyway he clearly targeted officers like officers of whatever army he was fighting at the time so they would target the officers um and they would execute them like just no like full stop just executing officers um whenever they caught them they seized trains of course this is literally seizing the means of production during the industrial revolution so seizing trains so on one side we see the bolsheviks doing this during the february and october revolutions and they're hailed as heroes but when nestor mock now does this he is uh he's a problem an insurgent right whatever we want to call him uh what else did they do uh they would throw foreign interlopers into rivers um especially the uh diaper river um and at first um he was helping the bolsheviks until they turned imperialist so the bolsheviks and the black army as we mentioned during like our brief foray into the civil war last episode in closing they would work together to defeat the white army but of course um eventually the bolsheviks would turn on the black army but for a little while yes he would run in bolshevik circles because they were for a little while allies okay it's at this point we get to the first Congress of the Confederation of Anarchist Groups in um, the spring of 1918. Again, it is a mouthful. First Congress of the Confederation of Anarchist Groups takes place in the spring of 1918, and they form Nabat, which basically translates as the alarm bell toll. So Nabat is now like this organization. Um, I mean, it is. It's the Confederation of Anarchist Groups. They're, we're just going to call them Nabat from now on. They have five main principles um, under the guidance of people like Nestor Machno. First, rejection of all political parties. That means Bolsheviks and Mensheviks um, and royalists or whatever we would be calling them at the time. Rejection of all political parties. Rejections of all forms of dictatorships, most importantly to include the dictatorship of the proletariat. Absolute rejection of that dictatorship, which is what really put him on like... Um, put the Bolsheviks on watch for him, like, because that's what they're fighting for is the dictatorship of the proletariat. He, their other principle, third principle, negation of any concept of a central state. Again, that's going to be a problem for the Soviet Union. Rejection of a so-called transitional period necessitating a temporary dictatorship of the proletariat. So not only do you get like no dictators of the pro proletariat, this argument for a temporary one is also bull and we're not following it. 
Um, also, the final one, the fifth principle, self-management of all workers through free local workers' councils, i.e. Soviets. So in other words, these Soviets that Nestor Machno envisions and Nabat envisions are not, there is no oversight. There is no oversight that, that goes up into eventually into Petrograd or, or Moscow or mm. no oversight. Completely the, like autonomous. Completely and voluntary. Okay. This is where we enter into like the Civil War period that again, we all too briefly mentioned at the end of the episode on the revolution. So the Civil Russian Civil War, long story short, it's 1917 to 1923. Um, real quickly, it is the fight for power after the um, end of the monarchy in Russia, for lack of a better term. Um, and it is fought um, mostly between the Red Army, i.e. the uh, Communist Bolsheviks, the White Army, which is a weird uh, amalgamation of people maybe loyal to, still loyal to the Tsarist crown, some people loyal to like a Russian nationalism, some people that want to keep fighting World War I for whatever reason they want to keep losing in World War I. Um, who else might be part of the white? Oh, the allies themselves. So once World War I ends, formally with allied victory, the remaining allies... Uh, England, France, United States, etc. They also now have a vested stake in Russia, perhaps not turning communist. So they're also helping, like aiding and abetting um, the White Army during this period of time, at least through like weapons and munitions and and some and some officers and things along those lines. Who else is part of the White Army? Anyway, the White Army is just basically they're capitalists as well. And then the third part that we're talking about here is the Black Army, the anarchists. Um, so, and there's also like smaller, minor nationalist movements seeking their nationalism. Sometimes they've been conscripted into the Red Army or the White Army or the Black Army, whichever one promises them their perhaps independent state of a Lithuania or a Latvia or an Estonia or something along those lines. But in reality, they're also fighting for the autonomy of their 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 states and state sovereignty. So, okay. That's the Civil War. It lasts for six years. It is super bloody. There's a lot of amazing battles. We're not necessarily going to talk about those. I want to talk about the fact that by September of 1918, Machnow, again, this is like one year out of prison, man, has formulated an army that fluctuates between formulated, formed. Was he like, it's, he's solving an yeah. equation? <laughs> yeah, he's like solving an equation. <laughs> Sitting up there. Um, okay, he's formed an army that fluctuates depending on like what time period we're talking about between 15,000 and 110,000 troops fighting under his command with a formalized infantry, cavalry, and artillery units. Um, that's pretty impressive when yeah, you're out of prison, right? And and again, he doesn't have like as rich an organizing history as some of the other guys. Um, so he must have been like, there must have been gravity and charisma mm -hmm. around this individual. Um, and you can even see it in the writings. If you look up some of his writings, that is definitely there. The cavalry was both regular and irregular guerrilla forces made up of both regular and irregular guerrilla forces, I should say. Um, and some war historians argue that the irregular guerrilla cavalry of the Black Army was the most efficient unit on any side of the Civil War. More efficient than anything the Bolsheviks could put together, more efficient than anything the White Army could put together. These people were just winning every engagement they they um, they found themselves in. And I mean, this is a huge argument that comes from the anarchist side of the debate, right, is that our irregularity and the way that we operate without central command and in a decentralized fashion is the specific tool that is effective against the very centralized, rigid, and bureaucratic military. Well, and it was their efficacy that the Red Army would eventually use to defeat the White Army before they turned on the Black Army. Like, so, like, the Red Army knew that for a lot of the grunt work or dirty work and the southern, like, um, sphere of the war sphere what is the word southern front of the war uh where ukraine is like they were using the black army because it was just so much more efficient than anything they were able to put together um so anyway they also use these cool things called uh, uh tachankas again my my russian or ukrainian in this case sucks but basically these you can find pictures of them they were like these machine horse-drawn machine gun carriages and they would just yeah i mean they would be marauding the countryside with these things um and they became kind of the symbol of um, of the black army, these tachankas, these like machine gun carriages would be seen and they'd have like these black flags on them. Sometimes it would just be the plain black flag of anarchism. Sometimes they would have like various sayings on the flag itself, uh, regarding of course, freedom and autonomy and sovereignty and things along those lines. So, um, they became like the symbol of the movement. And we've already talked in this, uh, uh, um, channel over and over again about the power of symbolism for revolutionary movements. These were some of those symbols. Okay, how were they arming themselves, though? Mostly from equipment that was abandoned 
um, by the German or the Austro-Hungarian army. So they were basically, like, most of the way they were equipping themselves in terms of weaponry was from uh, battles they were winning and literally just picking up the weapons on the ground um, or whatever would be left behind in the form of artillery um, and cannons. So, okay. Red Army commanders, though, during this time period where they're working with the Black Army to defeat the White Army, they declined to give them any sort of credit or accord. Um, they did not want to give the Ukrainian anarchists any sort of, like, legitimacy. So even though they knew they were using the Black Army to defeat the White Army, um, back in, like, Moscow or Petrograd, every victory would be reported as a Red Army victory, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean... This is not uncommon. We've seen this most recently in one of our, our um, well, not really recently. We did this episode like a year ago, but one of the great examples we like to talk about is the PKK and the YPJ and their defeat of ISIS while the United States took credit for it. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I, I can't think of other examples right now off the top of my head, but I'm sure there's plenty. Mm -hmm. But we see this happen quite often. One of the things that eventually plagued the Black Army, though, uh, again, especially since they're using a lot of German and Austro-Hungarian weapons rather than like Russian weapons, is the lack of ammunition. They started to run out of ammunition, bullets, whatever it might be. Um, and the fact that Ukraine was even less industrialized than other parts of Russia, there wasn't an easy way to like manufacture these. So that was one of the things that hindered them. And the Red Army was slowly but surely able to use this to their advantage when they eventually turn on the Black Army itself. Okay. Um, uh, back in Russia, VI Lenin, Lenin sent, uh, Lev, uh, Kamenev to interview Maknow and gauge the situation in the Ukraine, um, during this time period, as of course the black army is gaining more and more steam and it's reaching that peak of about 110,000 soldiers. Lenin, I mean, Lenin eventually took notice and he sent Kamenev down there. N Maknow had actually met Lenin before this back in, 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 uh, was it Moscow or Petrograd? I forget. I think it was Moscow, but anyway. And he sends them down to interview Mark now and like gauge, like, is this guy going to be loyal to us? Like, what's he really about? Like, can we rely on him? Um, in the meantime, Leon Trotsky now, like leading the Red Army, um, ordered the arrest of all Nabat members, right? That confederation of anarchists. He orders the arrest of them. The Civil War's not done yet. But once they feel secure enough in what the Black Army is able to accomplish in Ukraine, they want them gone. They've used them and they want them arrested. The White Army, however, during this time period, begins to gain ground in the South after Trotsky makes this error, um, which led to a number of Red Army mutinies. So, like, as the White Army is starting to make gains on the Red Army, a bunch of the Red Army soldiers, like, they mutiny against their own, like, Soviet officers. And as many as 40,000 of them join Machnow's army. So a lot of the Red Army defectors go on to join the Black Army, and hmm. this really upsets the the leadership, the Trotskys and Lenins of the world, which is super interesting. Um, in fact, like uh, uh, um, Machnow and them, Machnow and the Black Army are basically in the press or in like what's in these communist circles back in the urban areas are seen as bandits uh, by the Red Army, uh, basically until 1919, until they need them again. Um, one of the white army generals, a dude named Anton uh, Denikin, began driving towards Moscow. And he is, like, the Red Army can't really do much to stop him. He is, there is a good chance he's going to seize Moscow. And that would be um, perhaps the end of, like, the Bolshevik Revolution and their their potential takeover of, of the Soviet Union, or the formation of the Soviet Union, I should say. The Bolsheviks of the Ukrainian Directory, so there are Bolsheviks in Ukraine that are loyal to Moscow and Petrograd. They're loyal to Lenin and Trotsky and all those boys. Um, they quickly, like, in a panic, reach out to mock now in the Black Army. Like, can, can you do anything to stop this drive by the White Army? And, of course, they do. On September 25th of 1919, Machnow's forces hit Denikin's near uh, Paraganovka. Um, and the villagers of Paraganovka even join in on the fight to fight on the side of the Black Army. They're seen as, like, yeah, I mean, the part of the Ukrainian national movement, even if they're not necessarily... They don't believe in that, but they see Ukrainians fighting against these, um, the White Army. Um, and there is a little bit of, like, that nationalist sentiment that kind of enters in during these battles near para I, I actually said it pretty good the first time paraganovka anyway all right after some early setbacks Machnow supporters forced a retreat by the white army um uh and the white army receives heavy heavy casualties due to the um due to the effect of the black army offensives and guerrilla warfare within two weeks five more cities in ukraine fall under the um 
fall to the black army that were formerly either just like non-aligned or under the control of the white army. So within two weeks, he wins five more cities. The black army, again, brutally efficient at this moment in time. And of course, they have the people's supports. The white army was on the run. So basically, the red army is losing in Ukraine. They call on Machnow's forces after they had denigrated them, even arrested members of Nabat. Um, and then the black army basically turns the tide of the civil war on the southern front for them. I cannot stress this enough. Without the Black Army's intervention here in September of 1919, the Bolsheviks might not have created the Soviet Union. Like, this is a major turning point in the Civil War. For sure. Um, the White Army, even as it's like losing these cities to Machnow's army, is forced to deploy its best cavalry. The reason this is important is, like, they take their best forces away from, like, their fronts with the Red Army and have to reorient them to fight the Black Army, which makes life easier on the Red Army. And all of a sudden, weird, the Red Army starts winning battles now because they're not fighting the main forces of the White Army anymore. Um, which is super interesting to think about. So even if the Black Army is going to start losing a couple battles now to the better parts of the White Army, they're, what they're allowing, though, is the Red Army to, like, get its shit back together and start winning its own battles again. So if anything, they went from, like, a major, like, turning point of the war to now at least a super crucial distraction so that the Bolsheviks and the Red Army um, can start winning. Okay. Now, this is important. The White Army is forced to deploy its best against the Black Army. Um... They move their Cossacks away from Red Army fronts, uh, basically to the Ukraine, which is important. The Red Army now, especially in the Caucasus Mountains, um, began to like really gain some ground. And the Caucasus, of course, are in the, on that southern front as well. The back, Black Army essentially saves Moscow. Um, by 1920, now, the free territory of Ukraine, um, which is it's calling itself a free territory, was inundated with 20,000 um more like troops and tensions begin to rise. They are now seen as imperial occupiers. So the reason I frame it this way is the white army during it, like, how do I say this? So let's recap. The black army um, defeats the white army over and over again in Ukraine, causing other bigger parts of the white army to move into Ukraine. Um, and this leads to um, tensions in Ukraine itself among Ukrainian nationalists that are now seeing the white army as imperial occupiers. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Did I say that clearly? Hopefully yep. the listeners pick up on what I'm trying to say here. Okay. Machnow's forces began capturing them. Sources deviate on how many of these white army officers were executed versus set free, though most of the enlisted or conscripted members were certainly let go. Um, this also um, goes to um, eventually qualify for the Red Army as well, as the Red Army began to occupy parts of Ukraine as they began to pick up on some victories here um, in 1920. Red Army officers would also sometimes be captured. Um, and again, historical sources, depending on what story you're trying to tell about Machnow and the Black Army, would argue they tortured these guys or um, they were just executing them on the spot rather than just letting them go. Officers, it's, it's definitely kind of a mixed bag, at least in my research, what happened to them. But if you were just an every day rank and file soldier in either the white army or the red army and you're captured by the black army they're like you're just a dude being used by powers by state-sponsored power mm -hmm. we don't blame you for that go on do you boo um get out of here especially when it came to the estonian and latvian regiments for some reason they saw common cause with some of what they, they were fighting for mm -hmm. um so anyway it's during this time that we begin to see the Red Army as, again, they use the Black Army to win these like crucial battles in Ukraine, but now that they have a pretty much like a foothold in Ukraine, the Red Army does, they're going to start turning their back on the Black Army. And this is where the period of repudiations begins to take place of the Red-Black alliances. So first and foremost... I want to talk about this idea when we think about it historically of material apologists. So there are a lot of apologists on the communist side of things that basically say, well, the Reds were just doing what they had to do to secure the revolution. And they were doing, all, they turned their backs and broke their word with the Black Army over and over again because it was just more utilitarian, right? Like um, collateral damage is a word we would use now. Um, and it's so much rationalization and mental gymnastics that supporters of the Lenins and Trotskys and later on the Stalins of the world have to jump through for what they did here, which by all under all auspices is wildly unethical, um, if not blatantly immoral. They needed the Ukrainian Black Army um, to win the Civil War. But what they argue is once the Black Army had done what it was supposed to do, which was defeat the White Army, or at least distract the White Army long enough for the Red Army to win its battles, um, they felt that they don't need them anymore. What they really need is that Ukrainian grain. 
because of course they're dealing with food shortages. These food, sh food shortages date back to even the czarist regime. We need control over this. Well, Ukrainians, whether they're nationalist or anarchist, does not matter. This is ours. Mm -hmm. We are the people that work the land should be the ones that benefit from the land. But the Red Army and Trotsky sees no need for that. We are going to take control of Ukrainian grain production, whether you like it or not. Um, and this is where, um, again, people are saying, well, without this, then, 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 then the Soviet Union, the new Soviet Union is going to starve. I don't know. Any thoughts on this? Uh, like you said, it's from a materialist perspective, so complex, but it's funny because to, exactly how you worded that, right? Where like the workers that work the land should have rights to the fruits of their labor. Right. That's completely a socialist idea. But in this case, like they don't do it. Yeah, exactly. They seize it. Mm-hmm. They seize, they seize the means of production, not from the capitalists, but from the workers. <laughs> right. It's like the most hypocritical thing you could do. It's an absolute embarrassment to, to, to a lot of the supporters of Bolshevism. Absolute embarrassment. Um, because again, like even that article I, I, I use as one of the critical articles I, I used, I always like to have some critical articles of Mach now. Even that one was like arguing of the hypocrisy of the anarchists that like when it comes to military, when it comes to like actual fighting, they stop doing that whole like horizontal thing and they start having leaders like Mach now. Well, yeah, and during a military engagement, it's just easier to have a guy give mm -hmm. orders than everybody like vote every time. But here well, we plus but no one talks about this hypocrisy. Plus it's voluntary, right? Like anyone could have left Machnow's army at any time. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, it's, it's yeah. Anyway, okay. So we see this here. Basically, the far left um, peasant-run plots would prove insufficient for, and yes, I'm saying it, the more conservative socialist-like vision of what the Soviet Union should be. Because it's much more radical to allow, again, the peasant to run their own plots. Mm-hmm. Um, but they did not see that as efficient. That's not going to be efficient. Well, what 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 ideology uh, predicates a lot of its value on efficiency? Yeah, capitalism, right? Capitalism does. The socialists are sounding like capitalists here. Well, and it's this is the biggest critique that you hear from everyone about the Soviet Union, right? Is just the bureaucracy and how inefficient it became. Right. Um, okay. After saving Machnow, the Bolsheviks ended their formal alliances with Nestor Machnow, sometimes with him being aware of that, sometimes without him being aware of that. Um, and they are beginning to see him as a populist rival, of course, in, in Ukraine. They even send down the newly formed Cheka, which we talked about in the last episode on the Russian um, revolution down there to assassinate him twice. They tried to assassinate Machnow twice. Both agents were caught and quickly executed for obvious reasons. But mm -hmm. yes, they used the Cheka to try and assassinate Nestor Machnow, who, again, Nestor Machnow, they don't even, they're not even in power without Nestor Machnow. They might lose the civil war without him. Yeah, I think it's interesting because, like, we're talking about his, people critique his movement as, like, terrorism, but, like, it's so funny that, like, anyone in that situation, if someone sends someone to assassinate you, what are you going to do to that assassin? Like, well, they executed him. That's not very diplomatic. They, he was trying to kill me. Tea and crumpets, baby. Let's yeah. sit down and talk about this. That's, yeah. what, that's what's supposed to happen. Tea and crumpets. No. Okay. Um... Moving on, uh, by the fall of 1920, Leon Trotsky himself had ordered the death of thousands of Ukrainian villagers and peasants that were loyal to Machnow, basically trying to use a fear campaign to end the populism of Machnow. And and again, this like there's that state sponsored terrorism, for lack of a better, like killing peasants because they they might be loyal to Machnow, mm -hmm. and basically just trying to send a message to Ukrainians. And again, not just to Ukrainian anarchists, but perhaps also to Ukrainian nationalists as well. Right. Um, but again, Machnow is not a nationalist. I think Trotsky gets a pass on that often from the left. Like, they don't talk about that, right? Like, yeah. that's not an important, important part of his story. He also withdrew Red Army troops from the southern front of that war to allow Tsarist Cossack forces to overrun southern Ukraine. What I'm saying is that by 1920, the White Army had been defeated enough by the Black Army that they saw the Black Army as the bigger threat and remove troops to allow the white army to engage the black army more like i mean i get that trotsky's playing 3d chess at this point 3d 4d chess what am i trying to say you get what i'm trying to say yeah. he's trying to play like 4d political chess at this point um but i mean really like you use them to defeat the white army and then of course you allow the white army back in to try and help defeat them like it just seems it's unethical like, that's, that's the term I have to use here. It's unethical. Some might be listening and saying, well, God, it's practical. Like, well, it's fair in war. Oh, right? God, like, so many of you right now are, like, so pissed because they're like, oh, he's such a good military strategist. Of course you would do that, right? 
but yeah, I, yeah. But I mean, we come from the point of departure. Like, who cares about military strategy? One of the things that like seems to overrun all of our thoughts, whether they're economic, whether they're in military strategy, whether they're educational. If if you've been a constant listener of this channel, you know that we believe that like an ethical way of approaching things should like supersede all. Like, if you are not true to your character and the ideologies you at least pretend to follow, then anything, like, everything you're about will be hollow from there on. Mm -hmm. We did this with the American War for Independence and why the United States has become the way it has. It wasn't like, we haven't gone astray. This is how it was designed. Class stratification, racism, patriarchy, etc. Et the Soviet Union did not go astray. In fact, we would now argue, now that we've gotten through the Russian Revolution, it wouldn't have mattered whether it was Trotsky or Stalin that seceded Lenin. It was going to be an absolute nightmare for everybody that had to like basically live under under the pro the dictatorship of the proletariat like that's the hypocrisy built into it and so that's why we kind of come at it from this angle where we are willing to criticize everybody right left does not matter hypocrites wildly unethical most of the time especially when they get in positions of power does not matter any thoughts no agreed yeah. i mean that was a rant that i didn't plan on going on in this episode but i felt <laughs> like it needed to happen all right moving forward okay um so Trotsky's strategy of basically like removing like the Red Army from certain parts of Ukraine so that the White Army could come in and attack the Black Army was foiled. So on October, like basically the White Army was not able to win any of these battles, um, at least not significantly enough to where Trotsky felt like there was an advantage of perhaps allowing the White Army a glimmer of hope. So um, he decides he's going to renew the alliance with the Black Army. Again, he just keeps going back and forth. And again, people would say, just like you said, oh, this is just being a good military and political uh, strategist. But again, we would argue, do you have a backbone? Do you have a spine? Do you have any, right. like, what, who are you? Okay. On October I mean, 5th, if anything, you would have just had the alliance with the Black Army, completely obliterated the White Army, and then fought the battle, right? Yeah. On October 15th of 1920, uh, Trotsky ends up formally um, offering the Black Army a new alliance. And he sends comrade uh, Ivanov down there um, with a uh, military detail uh, to basically set up the political treaty with the Black Army. And also promise, the anarchists kind of push for this, a promise that all anarchists that have been caught to this point throughout all of Russia would be released. They've been caught as political prisoners. Um, those that survived and were not executed, as we talked about with uh, what Trotsky was doing earlier, they need to be released or else we're not doing this again. We don't trust you. And so, yes, uh, Ivanov basically says, yes, we're going to do that. And Trotsky says, yeah, it's, just tell him whatever you have to tell him. Tell him whatever you have to tell him. In the meantime, they do come back together, as Nick just said, Red and Black Army work together and events basically kind of finish off the White Army um, from being any real threat in Ukraine, um, as well as like allied forces. Meanwhile, um, back in Petrograd and Moscow, of course, the two important urban centers, the dissemination of propaganda, they refuse to publish or report on this alliance whatsoever. They refuse to even acknowledge any sort of alliance ever existed with the Black Army or anarchists. Um, in fact, anarchists and other parts of Russia outside of Ukraine were being arrested at higher rates than they were before the alliance. Any thoughts on the hypocrisy of the Trotskys uh, and Lenins of the world here? I mean, not by not letting the public know what you're doing back in the major cities, then it's easier in the future to turn on the Black Army. Well, and here's the other thing that they're super scared of. They saw the gravity of Mach now. We just talked about this earlier, that in under a year out of prison, he had organized like these peasant unions that were basically successfully seizing um, their means of production from the landed estate and redistributing the uh, land itself to the peasants. And they were able to actually become productive in grain production, e productive in grain production. They're being productive in, in making the grain uh, work for Ukraine. We also saw his efficacy in actually creating an army that at its peak was 100 10,000 strong without any formalized military training. He didn't have this. I mean, they don't want to publicize the alliance because it legitimizes the movement. It legitimizes the movement, but also they, they're scared of this guy mm -hmm. because what he's fighting for um, has arguably had much more gravity to it than what they say they're fighting for. And they've already gone back on what they say they're fighting for over and over again, even using like certain like capitalist strategies. Mm-hmm even using hierarchy, even the creation of arguably an uh, as oppressive, if not more oppressive state apparatus than the one they overthrew. Mm -hmm. They're scared of it. So many socialists are so mad at you right now. They're so scared of them. Hey, whatever. <laughs> they're LARPing. We already talked about it. The yeah. modern day ones are LARPing anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, God, right. now they're even more mad. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's get moving we gotta get moving we gotta get moving i have more to say but that would be just like you know whatever twisting the knife all right moving on 
Where am I? Okay, the anarchists in other parts of Russia, oh, we already said this, were being um, arrested in larger numbers than they were prior to this. Okay, Red Army morality. Uh, here we have it. After the Black Army helped clear the Crimea out of the White Army, uh, out of the Whites, the Black Army o Black Army officers were invited to the Southern Front headquarters under the auspices of joint planning. So, okay, Black Army already saves Moscow. Black Army then helps wipe uh, uh, the Ukraine clean of basically the White Army. They then are sent to Crimea as well and help wipe out the White Army there as well. As well. I said that like three times, but whatever. You get what I'm saying. After this, Black Army officers, not Mach now, were invited to the Southern Front headquarters. Anyone know what is going to happen to these officers? It's not going to go well. It's not going to go well. They were executed by firing squad nearly immediately. So they use them and they abuse them. They toss them out. Again, I want to chime in here. Well, I think it's interesting how they are the so quick to Army. charge Machnow and his movement with terrorism. But, I mean, they're doing the exact same thing. The Meanwhile, the Machnavist Treaty Delegation, which is still in Kharkiv at this point in time, um, the, the ones that actually signed this, this alliance, they're still hanging out in Kharkiv with, like, the Red Army. They are arrested and also, and this is the term that was used, like, liquidated. Like... <laughs> Wow, that's messed up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the people that literally, the, the ink's not even dry on this treaty, right? And the Black Army has helped the Red Army basically finish off the whites on the southern front. And officers are executed at the uh, southern front headquarters. And then back in the city of Kharkiv, they're also arrested um, and uh, executed as well or liquidated. Um, long story short, then 350,000 Red Army soldiers were sent into Ukraine to basically finish off the Black Army. Mm -hmm. That force was one of the larger forces used throughout the Civil War. Um, and let me be blunt, like from a like from a macro standpoint, the White Army was probably a bigger threat overall to mm -hmm. like the, the the actual legitimacy of the revolution. Um, given that you know it had all of this like these these groups that had basically come together as an amalgamation. It also had support of like various allied forces. It was a bigger threat, and I don't know. And maybe somebody can correct me in the comments since I am not a Russian Civil War historian by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not sure a force of 350,000 Red Army were ever sent against the White Army mm -hmm. the way they were sent against the Black Army. I might be wrong, and I'm willing to admit that I'm wrong right here. But I don't know the numbers on 350,000 to put down this other army that at its peak was only 110,000. And at this time, it's it's in the tens of fifteens of thousands. Right. Why such an overwhelming force sent to basically stamp out the Black Army? And like you said, they're scared, right? It's because it's so powerful. By 1921, only a handful of the original... Well, I mean, let's for just a second talk about the importance of the idea, right? The white army had numbers and support, as you just alluded to, but its ideals were not compelling in any way, right? No, it's like, more the same. Yeah. But the black army, on the other hand, is incredibly progressive and appealing if you are the peasant, right? Especially since you're already beginning to see the lies of the revolution come to fruition in your life. Yep. You went from being occupied by Cossacks to now being occupied by the red army. You're still occupied. And your grain is still being expropriated somewhere else. Maybe maybe it's not to fill the coffers of some rich land estate owner, but it's going to feed other people throughout Russia. And while we should be like, well, they should want to do that. Well, that's fine, but they're not allowed to even have any control over that process. Right. Like, that's fine if you want to take Ukrainian grain and feed all of Russia, but why can't the peasants decide how much they make? How much they sell it for? Why can't they decide that? Why is that being decided by the dictatorship of the proletariat? Yep. Okay. All right, moving forward. By 1921, only a handful of Black Army members, like, officially remained. Uh, Machnow, one of, um, uh, among them. And he was able to eventually escape to Romo Romania, and on the run, he finds his way to places like France. Um, this is, like, kind of like the final thoughts, um, in the words of Le none other than Leon Trotsky himself, and more denigration of the Black Army and the Machnow movement. This is what Trotsky had to say. Um, he says, Hostility to the city nourished the movement of Machnow, who seized and looted trains marked for the factories, the plants, and the Red Army. Tore up railroad tracks, shot communists. Of course, Machnow called this the anarchist struggle with the state. In reality, this was the struggle of the infuriated petty property owner against the proletarian dictatorship. I mean, I guess he's not really wrong, but this is him justifying the eventual quote-unquote liquidation of the Black Army. Any thoughts on what Trotsky's saying I do saying think here? he is wrong, because he's trying to denigrate them by saying that they're basically the petty bourgeoisie, the own the land I mean, yeah, that are okay. fighting okay. against the right the socialization of the land they don't know what's good for them 
Right. So just like capitalists would say, like, the unwashed masses don't know what's good for them, and the monarchists would say the, the unwashed masses don't know. Now the socialists are saying the unwashed masses don't know what's good. Mm-hmm. At what point do we get this ideal of, like, freedom and direct yeah. democracy? None of them follow through. I mean, well, in this context, it was coming from the anarchists, right? Right. Well, it was coming from the anarchists, and they're the ones that end up, quote-unquote, liquidated. Yep. We've seen this over and over again. Like, all of these arguments that are being made, that they have some sort of better, like, one-size-fits-all ideology and political process and it's going to be for the betterment of the people almost never is it almost never is Mm -hmm. right how quickly were the uh, eventually state leaders and then eventually the new federal entity in the early 1780s willing to like compromise the integrity of the bill of rights when it suited their material goals almost immediately with alien and sedition acts Mm -hmm. and putting down shays rebellion and putting down the whiskey rebellion and implementing higher taxes than the english ever did same thing here. How quickly are the Bolsheviks like willing to like overlook everything that Marx had envisioned and compromise the integrity? Well, maybe not everything, not the revolutionary vanguard, I guess. Although that's more of a Lenin thing. Yeah. That's that's more of a Lenin thing. He called it, yeah, I mean, that's what it is. Marx called it dictatorship of the proletariat and then slowly but surely it evolved into vanguard of the revolution. But how is that ever going to achieve like an egalitarian society when you're starting from this point of oppression? That's a much bigger debate. All right. In terms of Machnow in exile, by 1926, he's in exile. He ends up joining other Russian exiles in Paris, France. Uh, what other Paris? Would there be Paris, Texas? I don't know. <laughs> um, and he began writing the pamphlet, the very famous pamphlet, The Cause of Labor. This is what he had to say in retrospect as he is living his life out in exile. He says, the life of our modern society is full of great promises. No, no, screams the bourgeois socialists and communists. We disagree. Then they rush to the workers, marshal them into parties, and call on them to rebel as follows. Drive out the uh, bourgeoisie from their positions and hand their power over to us. We'll work for you. We'll liberate you. So the workers, whose hatred of government is even greater than their hatred of parasites, rise up in revolution to destroy the machinery of power and its representatives. But either because of clumliness or naivete, they allow socialism to come to power. This is how the communists got into power in Russia. These communists are real dregs of mankind. They tear down and shoot innocent people and hang liberty. They shoot men exactly as the bourgeoisie did. They shoot men who think differently to them in order to subjugate all to their power, in order uh, in order to enthrall them to the throne of government they have just taken over. They hire guards for themselves and killers for dealing with free men under the weight of the chains made by the new workers republic in russia man groans and sighs as he did under bourgeois rule dope he's not wrong he also ends up co-writing the organizational platform of the general union of anarchists anarchists this is where some controversy comes in now from anarchists against mock now because it's during this time period that he introduces now a fourth ideology that is often um, associated with mock now we did the first three i don't know at this point an hour ago at the beginning in the introduction here is now a fourth one that is credited to him and this is where he now gets critique from anarchists as well later on in life Platformism is basically anarchist organization that seeks unity from participants through platforms that include only people in full agreement with the core group ideas and rejecting people who disagree. To influence the working class and peasant movements, they feel like this like mass agreement is necessary. They still reject Leninist vanguardism in mass, um, instead aiming to, and I quote, make anarchist ideas the leading ideas within the class struggle. The four main principles of platformism are ideological unity, tactical unity, collective responsibility, and federalism. Any thoughts on that? Oh, this whole idea of groupthink is somewhat un-anarchist, I would argue, and I think that's why It anarchists... reminds me a lot of hegemony, like Gramsci, and it's happening at the same time here. It is happening at the same time. Right, like, it's, it's sort of like kind of an anarchist hegemony, right? That we need to make sure anarchism is the most powerful ideology, right? We need to win that culture war. That's kind of what it reminds me of. Um... And I, I, I feel, as much as I've critiqued Lenin and Trotsky for their hypocrisy and their moral and ethical bankruptcy, just like I would leaders of every other nation state that we've tackled, uh, really, I have. I, I don't think I've let anybody off the hook at this point. I pretty much hate, I'm an equal opportunity hater. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, in this case, I just, I'm struggling a little bit because so far I've been 100% on board, but like some of this is un-anarchist to me. Mm-hmm. It really is. 
um, this kind of like unity, ideological unity, which to me, some would argue anarchism itself is an ideology. I argue it's an anti-ideology, so thus making it still kind of an ideology. I don't know. Oh, God, we need to have an episode doing that debate, yeah. whether or not anarchism is an ideology. Yeah, well, and th- th- I think it would be a good debate. But that, again, you're the sociologist here, man. Write it up. Let's do it. Well, how am I going to write up the debate? You have to take one side and I have to take one side. I know, but you're going to be the one that leads it. All right, moving on. (laughs) Machno ends up dying in Paris of tuberculosis in 1934. His widow and his daughter were eventually deported to Germany for forced labor um, during World War II. They did survive that forced labor in Germany during World War II. I do not know how. I I won't pretend to know how. Mm -hmm. But they end up being arrested again after World War II by the NKVD in Kiev, Ukraine. Um, And then they are arrested and they put for the rest of their lives to more hard labor. So they spent basically the rest their life his wife and his daughter in labor camps god i mean that's sad as shit Mm -hmm. okay in closing in closing and these are not my words now i'm gonna let nestor mock now close out this episode here this is what he has to say um in a combination of quotes that i have kind of put together from both the struggle against the state and the anarchist revolution two of his more famous um writings this is what he has to say in fact that the modern state is the organizing Let's try this one more time, guys. The fact that the modern state is the organizational form of an authority founded upon arbitrariness and violence in the social life of toilers is independent of whether it may be bourgeois or proletarian. It relies upon oppressive centralism arising out of the direct violence of a minority deployed against the majority. In order to enforce and impose the legality of its system, the state resorts not only to the gun and money, but also to potent weapons of psychological pressure. With the aid of such weapons, a tiny group of politicians enforces psychological repressions of an entire society, and in particular of the toiling masses, conditioning them in such a way as to divert their attention from the slavery instituted by the state. A true collective is not built with programs or with governments, but with the freedom of mankind, with its creative and its independence. The freedom of any individual carries with it the seed of a free and complete community without government. A free society that lives in organic and decentralized totality, untied in its pursuit of a great human goal. That's fine. That's good. Find us online. Our website is revolutionandideology.com. If you're listening to this in your podcast app, give us a rating and make a comment that will help us rise in the rankings and find new listeners. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, give us a like and subscribe and leave us a comment and hopefully we'll have time to respond. Um, Thank you, thank you, thank you to our Patreon supporters. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, we're at patreon.com slash revolution and ideology. I'm Nick. I'm Jared. Later.